Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, really delighted to um, see you all and, and warm welcome from me. I'm Will Sibley. I'm the Business Relationships Coordinator at LEAF. And really thrilled to introduce you all to this session, kicking off our next series of, of LEAF surgeries. Um, to those of you who haven't been to a surgery before, um, LEAF delivers online webinars regularly with guest speakers um, for our members. Initially, these were set up in the first lockdown in 2020, and we've never looked back since. Uh, we've really enjoyed guest speakers covering a range of different topics, um, and of course, seeing our members and speaking to them too. Um, just to let you know, we are recording this session, and there'll be a 10 minute Q&A for everyone, to, um, everyone in the panel to answer your questions. Um, and for today's surgery, I'm delighted to welcome Philip Wynn. Um, Philip's career in farm business management has spanned nearly 50 years, and he's managed probably every corner and sector of agriculture along the way. Um, he is the director of Sir James Dyson's farming uh, family business since 2013, and he's now the interim managing director. And he's had a long connection with Leaf. Um, he was the farm manager of one of our first Leaf demonstration farms. Um, it was appointed chairman in 20. 17 and is currently the acting CAO. Um, so very warm welcome to Philip, he'll be chairing the session and providing a update on LEAF's current activities as well as our plans for the future um, and relating to, to this to um, you know current affairs and, and the big challenges across, across farming at the moment. Um, to add to this as well alongside Philip is our panel, we have Director of Technical Vicky Robinson uh, Director of Education and Public Engagement, Carl Edwards, and Director of this Development, uh, Claire Mike. So sit back and relax, have your cameras on. It would be great to see as many faces as we can. Um, and throughout the session, please do ask your questions via the chat function, which should be uh, the bottom left somewhere. You can send that to everyone or directly to me if you like. Um, and there'll be 10 minutes at the end for a Q&A with the panel. Um, so without further ado, over to Philip. Well, thank you very much, Will. And it's great to be joining you all today. Uh, one thing I ought to just probably put straight, I'm no, I am not, as I'm no longer the uh, interim CEO at Tyson Farming. I couldn't be doing both these jobs. Uh, I have now handed over to um, Dan Cross, who, who took over from me in January. So that has been uh, a, a great journey last year. And, and what I really want to do is, is talk a little bit about Leaf. Uh, and then I thought I'd share a few sound bites of some of the things that I'm involved with in the in the businesses that at, um, uh, uh, that I'm either director or chairman of or advise. Uh, and um, really, I hope that will provide some um, good areas for some discussion at the end. And and of course, the exec team are going to join me um, and give you some insights into the sort of three core pillars of our work and, and all the. The developments there and I, I think really I, I should probably start by saying you know this is probably one of the saddest years but also one of the most exciting years for LEAF. Yeah enormously sad uh, with the loss of Caroline in May. Um, you know she spent all her life determined to make things happen, to change the way we farm, um, to persuade people to look at things differently. Um, you know, she's left us in a phenomenal legacy, uh, which we, as both the board and the team at LEAF, are absolutely determined to build on. Um, you know, we, we uh, I think, or, or hopefully, uh, you all know that we're holding a memorial service for Caroline next Tuesday at Stanley Abbey. And you're all welcome to be there. It starts at 11.30. Uh, and that will be the opportunity for all of us to celebrate her life and share some of the many, many achievements which uh, Caroline uh, was involved with and made. So I hope you will join us. If you haven't already, let us know you're coming. We would appreciate it um, so that we can sort of cater, cater for numbers. But you know that has been a, a very, very sad time for us, but Caroline's left us a phenomenal legacy. And um, you know the exciting, Thing for us now is that so many things are coming together for LEAF uh, in all three core pillars of our work. And so her 30 year journey is just now showing and reaping um, those, those 
benefits. And, it, and then for me, it's sad that Caroline isn't actually here to see them. But, you know, we, we will, I'm sure, uh, do her proud uh, in the way that we develop. And um, as I say, Carl, Vicky and Claire will all update you in a little bit more detail um, when I've finished. Um, one of the things which you will be seeing is a lot of new faces. Um, the leaf has expanded exponentially. Uh, in a year, we've moved, well, we've doubled in size. We're, we're 39 people in LEAF today to support this development. You know, a lot of it is around the development of LEAF mark, but also in terms of education and the support technically um, and to, 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 to our teams on development. Um, and one of our strengths, of course, is that, you know, Caroline has coached and mentored a lot of the team over many, many years. And so we have a very, very strong exec team. And you know, I'm so pleased that you know, that is so robust and uh, working uh, really well together. Um, and as uh, Will said, you know, and in the transition now, um, I have taken on the role as a CEO and chairman just to provide the leadership to the senior team. Um, we are now, um, starting our search for a new CEO. Um, and um, I have appointed uh, a, a firm to support that process. And, uh, and uh, while it is going to be a challenge, uh, I'm sure that we will find over the next few months that inspirational leader that we want and require to take LEAF to the next stage. Um, you know, we've, we've got so much potential ahead of us. Um, we will, we are going to set our heart out to find that great person who will build on Caroline's legacy. So there's a lot happening behind the scenes. Um, I think, and just to conclude on that, what I want to say, what I really want to make clear is that Leaf is in great shape and, um, you know, um, the team will build on what I'm saying in a few minutes. What I thought I'd do is, is just talk around some of the challenges that um, I see in some of the areas that I'm working. And um, I, started, I started farming in my farming career in the very early 1970s. So over 50 years, I've seen enormous change. Um, and I think the, the one thing that's always been in the heart of all the various things to do has been farming. And I, I, I always come back to that being at the very center of everything that I've done, whether it's in my charitable work or whatever. And I think over the years, there are sort of three or four sort of guiding principles, which has sort of led me on my, my own journey. And, and those are, and I, and I think they're quite relevant today, really. One is to accept change and not, not resist change. Secondly, is to provide true leadership. And thirdly, it's to understand the detail so we actually can make better decisions. And I think those are the things that have probably guided me over this quite long period uh, of, of my career. And I think the other thing which I've always believed in, and that is that commercial farming and care for the environment can go hand in hand. And that's why my views and my philosophies are so very closely aligned with those of Caroline. So I think where we are in 2022, uh, I think these are unprecedented times, or unprecedented times for the country, or unprecedented times for, for farming. And what it is doing is putting people under enormous pressure. Uh, and, and if I uh, just allude to a few areas, so I, I do do a, a lot of extensive work in the fresh produce sector, um, and particularly in root vegetables. Uh, it's been a focus probably for the last sort of 20 years for me and my work. And um, what we've seen, particularly since COVID, is this dynamic shift in risk to the producer. Um, COVID gave us all the problems around labor, labor shortages, packaging shortages, haulage logistics. Um, it, it created issues we had never seen the like of before. And in 2020, 2022, we face the issues around fertilizer, fuel, energy, 
uh, and the well. You know, all the added value crops uh, require water. The cost of applying water, the number of applications we've made, uh, has made uh, managing these businesses incredibly pressured and difficult. And and uh, I think coupled with that, what we've also found is that the plans and programs that we've set with our retail customers have been very difficult to uh, predict and fulfill. Uh, and during COVID, we probably ran at 20% more than the plan, which was, again, challenging for us to make sure we could deliver that. And then we come into 2022, and for no, for no reason really at all, volumes dropped. So we went through a period of nearly five months with very, very low retail volumes. And in essence, crop left over, which is uh, probably the worst thing that can happen to any produce business to uh, plough crops in at the end that are not wanted. Um, and I think um, while where we are now, we'd see this big surge in costs. And um, we've, you know, we've, um, the speed at which we can recover this from our customers, um, there's a time lag. And so there's this big margin risk to these businesses. And while we've always worked on this one to 3% return, profit to turnover, we actually need now six to 8% to make sure that we can reinvest for the future. So I think what we're seeing in our sector is a lot of the risk appetite dwindling. And frankly, if we don't get customer support, people will actually um, grow uh, less crop in, in the future to reduce the risk. And I think, um, you know, there's going to have to be a mindset in this sector, a change in mindset for it to uh, be successful and prosperous in the future. It's, it's a very, very challenging time. The next point I'd like to is, is, is talking really about technology and farming. And, and um, you know, it's quite interesting what we see with my connection with Dyson Technology, you know, engineering is the core of that business. Um, UK has a shortage of about 60,000 engineers every year. In Dyson, we've uh, gone around that by building our own university and embedding engineers there that come back into the core business. And one of the things that I did do last year was actually build the relationship with Dy between Dyson Farming and Dyson Technology. And, and that has um, starting now to build some really good results. We've got eight engineers embedded within our Dyson Farming research team. And what we're finding, of course, is they're looking at the problems and challenges we face from an entirely different perspective, uh, things that we would never really have thought of. And that's in, within glass and the environment, within renewables and how we deal with digestate and dewatering, and also in the sort of basic engineering and farming. Actually, farming to be prosperous for the future needs science-led good engineering solutions. And, um, you know, from a government perspective, we should be encouraging them to invest. And it's not just investment in, in innovation, it's investment in practical solutions that will actually help us in the future. So I think in Dyson, we're very lucky. Um, we need to, as an industry, get the government to ensure that that investment that they're making is going to produce some you know, practical solutions for us in the future. Um, I think uh, one of my, you know, it's interesting when we're, we're all very focused on the energy crisis, but actually uh, in energy, we're self, we will have about 70% self-sufficiency. In, in food, we only have 54% if we uh, take, uh, uh, take account of exports. And, um, you know, the reality is that if you take my point about the appetite for risk, and we do see uh, farmers and growers reduce their exposure to risk, then actually, um, you know, the, our country is quite exposed in terms of food sustainability uh, for the future. And the potential for an even bigger crisis in terms of food is definitely there, unless government actually take it seriously in the, for, for the future. And, and we certainly will be making our point to government as far as Dyson Farming is concerned about what needs to be done to protect our position. I have been part of a, a group, a stakeholder group that's been looking at the net zero journey and advising ministers uh, on that journey and some of the barriers, systemic barriers to um, success. Um, and I, I found it interesting. There was a research document that came out a few weeks ago, probably a month ago, 
that was looking about at sustainability. And one of the interesting statistics is that the high percentage of farmers who didn't really think that actually this whole area of emissions was important to their business. Well, it is actually important to all our businesses because reducing emissions um, will make our businesses far more resilient for the future. And for most of us, it's all, you know, accepting the lifestyle step, but for most of us here in, in arable farming and produce, it is around the utilization of energy, fuel, and fertilizer. And you know, the, one of the, um, one of the barriers, I think, to looking at this, and this is the point we made to government, is there needs to be a consistent measure, measurement and standards uh, for emissions. Um, and I think only government can really get a hold of that. There are so many calculators out there, all doing it slightly differently. And uh, frankly, there needs to be some leadership. Uh, and then, of course, it will be much easier for everyone to really understand where they are and perhaps for the future to be properly rewarded for what we can achieve. Um, so I think we've, we've, there are some bold ambitions there in terms of uh, net zero, um, but actually we do, the basics is actually understanding and having a common calculator. One of the, one of the other is, of course, is that, you know, we've got, people have got to understand how they can make this journey. And there is no doubt in my mind that peer-to-peer -peer learning is at the heart of this. And of course, LEAF could play a really important role here. And, uh, and I'm going to ask um, Claire in a minute to talk a little bit about the journey um, with the Co-op Foundation. Um, and of course, the other part of the net zero journey is maintaining our soil health. And you know, I think we're all so much more focused on this now, but actually in the future, we need to be fairly familiar with what we're doing. So I think I'll just, I was just gonna finish now because I'm conscious of time, but I thought I'd just sort of, I've just put a few bullet points together as you know, from a general perspective, where are we as farmers? And I, and I, I think, you know, we, we are in uncharted waters. Um, this is new to us. And I think when I'm talking to people, um, there's no history that we can rely on as to where we are today. You know, we're, we're making decisions, we're having to, we're there are new challenges every day. And there is no history to back up um, what, how, how, we, how we look to the future. And the risk to all of us in this margin gap where, particularly in the commodity sector, where the point at which prices drop and costs remain at these high levels is, is as we move out is, is an enormous challenge and a risk to all of us. Um, and I certainly, from my advice and what I do on the farms where I'm more hands-on, we, we are trying to cover that risk by moving out with our sales values back into 23 and 24 so that we're not left hanging with this gap in the margin. Um, I think that technology is going to be really important to us all. My concern to technology and farming is actually around the cost of entry because a lot of the new technology is highly expensive and probably will be out of reach of a lot of the smaller farmers. So I think as an industry, we're just gonna to have to work together much more closely so that we can, as these new ideas and innovations come out, make best use of them. Um, you know, because I think the two, uh, the two key words for the future will be, we've got to be probably more productive and more competitive uh, to have resilient businesses. And I fear, particularly with the spending that we're seeing uh, within, uh, within the within government now, we should expect inherently less government support. Um, you know, I, I fear that will happen. Uh, we need to make sure whatever support we do get is focused on the areas that will make the best difference for, for our industry. Um, so I think, it, I think the future, um, even I've seen a lot of things in 50 years, but you know, the future of running our farms is not going to be for the faint hearted. There are going to be lots of challenges and we're just going to have to address them, you know, each and every one um, as they come along. So I think that's enough from me. Um, thank you for listening. And I, I, what I want to do now is introduce the team and ask them a few to comment on a few areas. And I thought I'd turn to Vicky first, who joined us earlier in the year uh, from Natural England. This is Director of Technical. 
Um, and I think a couple of things, Vicky, I'd quite like you to talk around. And one is, how, how do you see our leaf demonstration farms? I think we're 41 now. How do you see them um, supporting and developing peer-to-peer -peer learning and, and perhaps looking at that slightly differently? And you've got an enormously growing team of people in your technical area now supporting leaf mark development. How do, you, how, do you, how do you see that? What are the challenges? So Vicky, can I ask you to, to fire away first? Yeah, no, thank you very much, Philip, and great to see everyone um, on the on the call today. Um, yeah, so no, I mean, in answer to your first question around the the leaf um, demonstration farms um, and peer to peer learning, you've already you've already mentioned Philip, and I think you know, our network of now forty one. So we've launched four demonstration farms this year, added to our network, um, starting with our southernmost farm on, on Jersey with Jersey Royal Company and now our northernmost um, farm as well with HB Farms up in Aberdeenshire and also Newhouse and Yattenden um, as well and, and those latter three were all part of the first Resilient and Ready programme which Claire I know we'll, we'll talk a bit more about shortly um, and also we've also of course not forgetting our LEAF um, innovation centres we've now got 15 of those with Rothamsted Harpenden joining us in September and all of all of our network are absolutely fundamental to, you know, as we go, go forward to address some of the challenges that Philip has, has outlined and that importance of that on-farm demonstration um, is, is vital. And I think, you know, the reason for that is the challenges we face, they're not simple, they're complex. There's a lot of independencies between them, um, you know, very much across all sections of the integrated farm management wheel that we, that we obviously know and love so much. And you know, it's, it'd be, to be able to actually go out and hear from other people and hear from people like myself, you know, people like yourself, that's sort of that natural sort of wanting that, those connections um, on, those, on those farms and actually being able to, to see and, and kick the dirt is, 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 is just incredibly important. And um, something that's really struck me since joining LEAF is the mindset, and Philip again referred to mindset earlier, and the mindset of all our farmers that we work with and those on the on our demonstration farms and being able to sort of look forward and see those opportunities and to you know through being a demonstration farm to be able to share those opportunities that they see despite all the challenges you know being able to see a way through and i think you know that as absolute sort of influencers but also ambassadors for what we do is um, going to be ever more important and and say getting out on farm as well as obviously you know there's obviously the technical aspects of learning but you know with it's a social side of things as well and just having that support um, with peers to talk through some of the difficulties that are facing um, because you know it's very hard to face change if you're not in a good place good place mentally um, and, and working with our innovation centers as well I've mentioned those so with in terms of where we're going with integrated farm management you know we're constantly looking at you know where next how can we keep progressing um, keep learning about integrated farm management to develop that evidence which can then obviously be realized on farm and shared through our network of demonstration farms so really linking our innovation centers and our demonstration farms and you know really keen to Look at you know, developing our, our network as you know, as I said and, and Philip mentioned, we've got 41 demonstration farms, 15 innovation centres. You know, where have we got gaps? How can we ensure that you know all farmers can sort of have um, a look and see a business that they can that they can you know, be, be associate themselves with, whether it's the geography sector, um, business structure. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's a bit about um, about the, our, our network. We've obviously also got our Beacons of Excellence program. We've got our you know our first um, group who are focused looking at regenerative agriculture, um, and so that's going going. Front. We've got a fantastic group of farmers who are getting together again, often on farm, to share you know all their their wisdom around around regenerative agriculture. And we're thinking, okay, where next with our beacons? What's our you know what's our next group going to focus on? What's the themes we're wanting to do? How can we you know ensure that we continue to work with this with this amazing group of individuals? Um, so I think that's probably it on the on the on the on the network. Um, in terms of the the expansion of of Leafmark, obviously the number of growers we've got um, is expanding. Um, both in terms of number, but also the number of countries that we, we are operating in. And so you know, we're looking at how we support our growers. How do we support them through the process of becoming LeafMark certified? 
um, and how can we you know, make that process as, as simple and as positive as possible. So that, you know, that involves looking at the guidance that we provide, you know, infographics to sort of the simple steps to becoming LeafMark certified, but also areas such as looking at, looking at translations. And also we're exploring how we can provide in particular overseas growers with you know, connections to farmers who are LeafMark certified in their country. So it's again, to introduce that aspect of peer-to-peer -peer learning overseas as well. And doing that through, you know, through an ever-growing, growing team that sits in the technical area of LEAF. And in terms of um, the standard, we're about to publish version 16 of the standard, which will go live um, on the 1st of April. It's being published next week. But we're already thinking ahead. Where next? And where do we want to, where do we want to go next with our LEAF mark standard to ensure that it's very much out there at the forefront of, of integrated farm management, showcasing that at its best, and obviously incorporating all the principles of regenerative agriculture, which is very much obviously a word that's talked about a lot at the moment and that then feeds back into the work that the technical team do around that research so again those sort of collaborative approaches of working working with our research institutes to look at that that evidence which then say it's a it's a feedback loop into into the leaf mark standard and you obviously the research um, landscape's changing slightly currently the team is sort of heavily involved in horizon 2020 projects but that's moving now obviously more towards defra funded projects in the farming innovation program so yeah, it's a really exciting time. There's a huge amount going on, and and you know across the breadth of integrated farm management, um, the network, just uh, yeah, just so much, so much to do. Um, and it does feel, although you know, appreciating there are a lot of challenges in the industry, it is a very exciting time. And and as as Philip has said, you know, an exciting time for Leaf and and what we are doing. So Philip, Thank I you, will Vicky. stop there. Anything I else? Think, you yes, want to ask I'm me? conscious of time. <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> Well, <laughs> <laughs> reducing what Claire can say. Um, so Claire, who's uh, Director of Business Development, um, a little bit on the Cortiva Resilient and Ready, a little bit of perhaps about the Co-op Foundation work on the road to net zero. That yes, so, yeah, I'd to talk about those. Uh, thank you and welcome everyone. Great to see so many of you rejoining the surgery. We're delighted to be back. Um, so yeah, we're doing this project. We, we've just coming to the end actually of the first cohort of Resilient and Resi that we're delivering in collaboration with um, Corteva AgriScience. We took four farms on this first cohort on a, a kind of all expenses intensive journey to explore sustainable approaches on their farms. Uh, they've been supported by both the LEAF team and the Corteva teams as well. And we've gone through a range of things like assessments on farm, monitoring and measuring, expert advice, testing, trials, you name it, we've thrown it at the farmers and they've coped really, really well. Uh, we've also um, we've also uh, uh, um, enabled the farmers to go on our speak out training, which uh, we will be actually holding a little bit later on this year. So watch this space. Um, and that training really helps farmers, well, any any anybody really, to help share their their journey, their stories through social media and a range of other platforms. Um, and the farmers have also been uh, supported while they do some practice events virtual and in person. I know that some of you came along to a couple of events during lockdown, particularly the ones on biodiver biodiversity and carbon. And essentially all of that three year um, journey has led to this summer, as Vicky mentioned, the farms launching as leaf demonstration farms. Um, so we've got the farms in Scotland and uh, a couple of farms here in England. And actually, the exciting news, Philip, is today we are launching our search for farmers for cohort number two. So later on this afternoon, we've got a virtual discovery event, uh, followed by in the next few weeks, a couple of in-person discovery events as well. So, yeah, shameless plug. But if anybody's interested, do get in touch. Um, like I say, the virtual events this afternoon and the in-person event uh, events are coming up. So, yeah, that's a little bit of a summary, a summary of Resilient and Resi. It's got so much traction out there. We've had events that have been so well attended um, and actually the farmers journeys have just been so compelling to everybody that's been following them so yeah um, that's been really exciting let me talk about right. the oh sorry yeah. Right to net zero <laughs> yeah let me talk about the co-op <laughs> foundations funding for launching five net zero 
I'm going to say on the journey to net zero, probably dem leaf demonstration farms over the next three years. So look, I don't think we're under any illusion that we'll get every single one of these farms to net zero by that time. And as we know, it's always a work in progress. There's always continual improvement. So we're kind of naming it informally <coughs> on the journey to net zero. There'll be four farms based here in the UK, one farm based overseas, which will be really exciting. That will actually be our first a fit, a real overseas demonstration farm. We do have a farm in Jersey, but we count Jersey within our own UK. So um, it will be our first uh, uh, overseas. Again, we'll be taking farmers through assessments, through that monitoring and measuring, throwing the expert advice at them. We'll be really focusing, obviously, on carbon footprinting and also exploring what technologies could help at farm. And up really drilling down into those affordable technologies picking up on what you were saying earlier philip um using sensors and things like that and again testing and trialing we're aiming to establish all of them as demonstration farms so that they can share their journeys and their learnings and we're going to be able to build case studies from each of them as well so that we can benefit a, a much larger number of farms we all know that this is a really exciting space at the moment mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we're, we're really, really excited to do that. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about the Co-op Foundation. We, we've just closed yeah. actually um, uh, um, uh, the entries to, to come onto this, except if you're in Wales, by the way, we've extended that a little bit longer. So if you do know any farms in <laughs> Wales, please do ask them to reach out to us. We'd love to hear from them. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so that's Co-op Foundation and the Net Zero Farms, and perhaps just a little bit on how we're working with some of the partners that we have in other areas, particularly in that space of Leafmark, which is so exciting. Gosh, I'm sure you all know uh, and have seen the news over the last 18 months. But yeah, we're delighted to be working with a great range of brands, retailers, um, uh, and uh, particularly with, with that Leafmark Assurance System. We already have very long standing relationships with Waitrose and M&S um, and Jordans that we're so thankful for. But now we've added Tesco to that pot as well. PepsiCo, Lidl, Mindful Chef are all coming on board with Leafmark. We're going to be working with these partners over the next few years. And look, what this means is that, you know, within the next couple of years, Philip, we're going to have leaf certified farms in over 50 countries, potentially, which is which is huge. And, and just, yeah, um, so exciting for leaf. As Vicky explained earlier, what are the challenges that come with that? Well, obviously, you've got things like language barriers and being able to demonstrate to those farmers. So as Vicky mentioned, we're going to be looking at how we translate resources, but also how we get those advocates and those leaf demonstration farms on the ground in those countries. So, yeah, we're going to be working. I say we, the royal we, Vicky and her team are going to be working very hard on that over the coming weeks and months. But yes, really exciting time for Leafmark too. Good. Well, that's great. And and I guess there will be, which we can't really talk about, others coming in the pipeline. So watch this space. I'm sure there will be, Philip. <laughs> Carl, can I turn to you? Um, I mean, two things, Carl. Firstly, uh, Leaf Open Farm Sunday, back on, uh, back on you know, as normal this year. Um, some feedback on that. Um, I know it's been incredibly positive. But perhaps you'd just share a few of those uh, sound bites. And then also, you know, we've seen an exponential increase in the educational work that we're doing with with children mm -hmm. so tell us a bit more about the next steps in the educational world uh thank you philip so uh to start with uh leaf open farm sunday then well what a year really um we we started to give some context to this year's open farm sunday when we were still in lockdown and we still had restrictions in place and we were still thinking about what june 2022 would look like for us well, actually, we were blown away. Over 250 farms opened their doors to welcome the public and over 175,000 visitors went out on Open Farm Sunday this year. Um, so I think, and I know Annabelle's on here and she'll correct me if I'm wrong in any way, shape or form, but I think it's now over 2.9 million members of the public have actually been out on Open Farm Sunday since its first inception in 2006. Now, what's really pleasing behind those, stat those specific stats is actually 20% of those um, members of the public had never been out on farm before, had no connection to farming, had no understanding of food production. So even 16 years on, we are finding the public are as interested as ever before. And actually the conversations that are happening on farm are much more in depth. It's not just a free fun family day out. 
Um, and, and actually, we, we go back um, a month on and um, four months on to our uh, uh, audience and, and those that went out onto farm and asked them a little bit more about what they learned and, and what they experienced from Leaf Open Farm Sunday. Um, and actually, 79% of those that went out onto farm said that they learned something new. 85% of those said that it had increased their trust in British farming. Um, and actually 56% of those went out said, actually, Leaf Open Farm Sunday positively changed their opinion of food production and farming. We were really blown away actually by the next two, next two statistics that we had from, from the results. And so much so we kept going back and checking them all. But actually 72% of the public felt that they could clearly see how the farming industry had adapted to help combat climate change and the climate crisis. And I'll come a bit more onto that positivity that we're seeing um, in a little bit. I mean, actually almost half of all visitors that attended the Leaf Open Farms and the event said that someone in their group um, or themselves would consider a career and had their eyes open to career opportunities in our sector. So just to reiterate again, Leaf Open Farm Sunday is continuing to have those incredibly, incredibly positive impact for us as a sector. Stats are brilliant and they're lovely as sound bites. What's been fantastic to see this year, though, is we've developed um, what we're calling internally our scrapbook, our Open Farm Sunday scrapbook. And I'll put a link in to the chat for this for everyone to see. But we've been able to collate a lot more of that direct feedback, both from the public that have attended and also from the farmers themselves that have opened up. And we are incredibly grateful for all of the hosts, all of the thousands of volunteers that allow Leaf Open Farm Sunday events to actually take place. And the feedback has been phenomenal, both in terms of the support that they've had and they've they've offered and the community coming together to back up um, the farmers opening up um, and neighbouring farms helping other farmers to open up. And also from the public and what they learned and, and how we've maybe challenged some of those misconceptions that they've maybe had in the past. Um, as Annabelle, uh, Tabitha and myself know, when we go out onto Open Farm Sunday, we very much talk to the public. And we listen to what they're saying, and it is so much more positive. People are going out to learn about where their food is coming from, to engage with it, to understand themselves as a, con as a conscious consumer. And that is so brilliant to see. I think, Philip, in terms of the second point then, um, and you've highlighted very much so that we are seeing exponential growth in terms of the engagement around leaf education, the desire to work with us, and actually the ask of our services more than ever before. And I promise I won't just go into stats all the time, but just a couple of headline ones, we haven't launched them yet, but our leaf education stats, over 35,000 children worked with last year. That's in school, that's on farm, that is direct delivery that our team of regional education consultants have delivered across England and Wales. And that's not two minutes spent with children, that's hours of our time spent with children um, in hundreds and hundreds of events across those two areas. Now, not forgetting then, we said five years ago to industry, we put out there that we need to work more with secondary age students, so our teenagers. Um, I'm really, really pleased to see that in this last year, we've had a fivefold increase in the number of teenagers that we're working with, the number of secondary age students. It's brilliant. Our, sec our primary work will continue. As an industry, we do a lot of work with primary age children, and that is absolutely fantastic. And lots of people talk about actually having that engagement at primary age is really important to inform them for the future, and it absolutely is. However, the secondary piece is absolutely key to consider career opportunities. Um, being head of careers and, and deputy head of a number of schools across the West Midlands, that is the time when young people are making those decisions, and it is incredibly important. We're also really proud this year that uh, we worked with almost 500 farmers over the course of the year to train them to deliver high quality safe farm visits, to provide them with professional development training in how they can work more uh, with young people, with the wider public as well. 
Now, where are we going and, and how are we moving forward? So for us as Leaf Education, it is more about engaging with that secondary age group. Um, we're really proud to be working with the School of Sustainable Food and Farming in our second piece of pioneering teenage research. And there'll be more uh, results to come out um, around that as the year progresses. But actually, it's highlighting that the government back in April launched their climate change and sustainability agenda for education. This is the DfE um, in conjunction with DEFRA. Um, and actually, we're highlighting how this holistic approach is needed, this whole school approach, this management approach from schools, because actually young people are absolutely committed to understanding more about the work that we do about our industry. Our national competition this year, now in its fifth year, um, has seen actually two thirds of those young people that came on the national competition have applied for and entered land-based colleges and universities. I don't think there's anything out there that our sector does that can claim those kind of meaningful impacts and results for the young people that they work with. And I've said for a long time that there is no magic bullet to get people to enter our industry. It's resource heavy, it's time heavy. It is incredibly rewarding, but we have to give that time that resource to that. So all of our work is about meaningful impact. So again, going back to what this year and future years will look like, um, we've had the chance uh, this year to work with our European partners, our European Institute of Technology, and they can't believe what we do in the UK to engage with young people. They actually can't believe what we as a sector invest and give freely as a sector to young people. And actually, I think it's fair to say, and these words were used, that they're in awe of what we in the UK actually do and deliver. Um, and I think there's a lot to, to learn from our European partners, but there's a lot for them to learn from us. Also working uh, with Reading University this year and understanding the Global South and the challenges and issues that they have around young people, their perceptions of the industry, um, their challenges of getting young people into our sector, it is completely the same uh, as the challenges that we face. Young people uh, have an interest, but don't understand the mechanism, the opportunities to get into our sector. Uh, so that was really interesting. Uh, I also learned quite quickly that, same in the UK, if you want to get hold of a farmer, you either ring them or WhatsApp them, don't email them. Um, that's the same from Kazakhstan, Ghana, UK, across the world, that is the way that you want to engage with our farmers, then that is what you need to do. And it was really interesting to see, we obviously have farmer time here in the UK, have thousands of schools and farmers that are connected um, and regularly uh, having those conversations. It was interesting talking um, in uh, students in Ghana and Uganda, how they might connect using local radio stations as, as the way. So technology is slightly different, but actually the opportunity to connect is just the same. So finally then we will continue to deliver on behalf of industry but with this exponential growth we need industry's support now more than ever we need support around engaging young people with research and development and the science and as philip said the the dyson research is incredibly important there um working with the john innes center this year is incredibly important for for us um but actually, it's about bringing together those partnerships. As uh, Claire, Vicky and I know, we had a meeting earlier this week and uh, with Judith Batchelor, and she very much said it's about plugging in. And I think that is absolutely the place that we are at. We are looking for those partners to plug in. None of us can do this alone, but actually the, the challenge is growing more and more, and we are delivering against that challenge, but more of us need to join that partnership. Um, I'm gonna end actually with a quote that most of you will know from Caroline, and now more than ever, it is really important. Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. Uh, if you want to go far, you go together. And that is really important for us as LEAF to, mm -hmm. to stand behind that. Well, thank, thank you, Carl. Yeah, thank you, Carl. That, that's a great way to finish. And, and I hope everyone that you can see the sort of depth and diversity of the things that we're actually doing at LEAF. Um, there's so much going on. These are really just sound bites. There's, there's an awful lot of detail work going on in the background. So, you know, um, uh, we, we, we're delighted with all the support we get from all of you, all our members, all the people who are interested in LEAF and what we're doing and where we're going. But 
you know, uh, just to emphasize, we're in great shape. There's a lot to do, and we're going to build on Carolina's legacy. So back to Will. We haven't left you much time for Q and A, Will. We've, no, we've I was, I was, I was thinking. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I, I think we should leave it there and finish on that great yeah. message, just just from you and, and Carl and the rest of the panel there. Um, and and thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, surgeries from now on, instead of being every fortnight on a Friday, they'll be every second Friday of, of the month. So the next being on the fourteenth of October. And we'll focus on innovations for food security. So we'll look into two quite novel innovations in uh, vertical farming and cultured meat, which is quite exciting. So please do come along and listen to our speakers. Um, but, but for now, thank you very much to our panel and audience. It was really good to see you all and um, enjoy the rest of your days and, and your weekends. <laughs>